Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Today we're studying a chapter of God's Word that many Christians live as though it doesn't really exist, that they've got to handle this principle anyway. 1 John chapter 4 is giving us the test of love. Most people think they're loving, even if others might disagree. And when they come to passages like this, they just kind of glance at it with an indifference and be like, yeah, you know what? Been there, done that. I'm good. And yet we're going to see as we dig into this passage that 1 John chapter 4 is calling us to a kind of love that can only come from God and people who ignore this principle, ignore it to their own peril. So welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. My name is Russ Brewer, and it is wonderful having you join us today as we go through 1 John chapter 4. Now, 1 John chapter 4 is one of the most in-depth discussions on the nature and the necessity of love in the entire Bible. This is the kind of passage that should cause us to pause and consider its profound message and then seek God to be changed by him. But before we get to John's teaching on love, we need to realize its context. And so, like much of the book of 1 John, chapter 4 is giving us further tests on how to determine whether or not a person is truly born again. And so the first test in this chapter is related to how we handle false teaching. The second test is how we live out God's love. And so verse 1 starts it out by saying, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now notice in verse 1, John's linking between these prophets and the false teaching of these false prophets and the spirits. And that's because there is a spiritual dimension behind the teaching on spiritual things. And false spiritual truths are ultimately sourced in a spiritual world that's opposed to God. Now, as we look at this passage here, John's going to give us ways to discern whether or not someone's actually teaching true truth. And so in verses 2 and 3, John says that anyone who believes that Jesus came in the flesh is from God, and anyone who denies this is not from God. But here's the thing, before we look at these actual verses, what they're teaching, these specific tests were for the false teaching that John's readers were battling in their day and in their churches. In our day, there may be some other forms of false teaching that passes this specific test, but it's still false teaching. And so the real principle behind these opening verses is that we can't just accept any old teaching. Instead, we need to have discernment. We need to know God's truth and measure any teaching we receive according to the word of God. And so the principle of these opening verses here is that we need to evaluate what we're hearing against the standard of recognized, established good doctrine. And if we keep our focus on God's word and seek teachers who help us to understand God's word better, we'll be able to discern who is actually teaching us from scripture versus who is just using smoke and mirrors. And that's what these false teachers were doing. They were teaching things, but not using the word of God. And they were therefore then leading people astray. Now in this passage here, John is particularly concerned that they don't fall into these early forms of Gnosticism that was just sweeping through the region. That's why John focuses on whether or not these teachers or these so-called spirits are teaching that Jesus has actually come to flesh. Now, you might remember that this Gnostic heresy that was brewing in John's day said that God was too holy to have any part in this sinful world. And since Jesus was God, and that was something they did hold to, since he was God, he's too holy to actually enter into creation. And John is showing us here that if a person denies the basic point of the incarnation, they're fully off the tracks. That's not a minor detail. And so the takeaway from these opening verses is that teachers that we listen to have to hold to the core tenets of the faith. And we need to know them ourselves and have discernment and only listen to those who likewise hold to the core teachings of the faith. They, of course, can teach throughout the whole scriptures. But if they're getting the core things wrong, We can't trust anything else they say, and so that's just an important principle for just guiding who we listen to. Now, as we go on to verse 4, John then wants to encourage his readers that they don't need to be intimidated, that these false teachers have some key ingredient that they're missing. So often, false teachers will be basically hucksters, and they'll be selling some key ingredient that's missing in our walk, and our marriage, and something else, and they'll teach us, and they'll sound so convincing. They'll be these engaging preachers, these convincing debaters. But if their teaching is rooted in their communication skills or their writing skills or their ability to to just proclaim and be convincing, and if it's not being driven by rich biblical content, then we should be wary of them because the Holy Spirit doesn't need all these external things to build up his people. He will use his word of God, and that's what the Holy Spirit-filled teachers teach us. They teach us how to understand God's word better. And so in verse 4, John says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
And so John's point is, is that rather than being intimidated by or enthralled with these false teachers, the spiritual reality of actually being filled with God's Spirit puts a true Christian's discernment and understanding on how to live the Christian life way above the false claims of these false teachers. They're just selling stuff of this world. And if John's readers were tempted to be impressed with these false teachers, John wants them to understand that they have nothing to worry about. These false teachers in verse 5, they're from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. And even though these false teachers sound impressive, their teaching is actually derived from the world's thinking, and so it's impressive and meaningful to those who are still in the world and of the world. And so John's saying these teachers, they gain popularity because false Christians who are still of the world are looking for a teacher who will manufacture a sense of fellowship with God. And so these false Christians are drawn to people who seem like they've got everything figured out, this whole spiritual stuff figured on out. And they're basically saying, if I can just listen to this teacher, maybe he will, or maybe she will, or maybe their enthusiasm will spill over into my life since just me reading the Bible isn't doing it for me. That's a dangerous place to be. And it makes people very vulnerable to false teaching. So instead in verse six, John says, we are from God, as in John and the apostles are from God. And so he who knows God listens to us. Those who are truly born again will read God's word. And this is from God's word, John's message here. And it will resonate with them because they are of God too. They don't need some fantastic motivational speech to move. They just need the clear word of God explained to them so that the Holy Spirit will use his word in their life for just transformation and obedience. And the reverse is then true as well. If a person hears John's teaching and is not drawn to it, and if they need some other enthusiastic kind of teaching to hold their attention and rivet them to the word of God, they don't want to take these truths and live them out on their own just naturally. Well, then that's evidence that that person is not born of God because he who is not from God does not listen to us, John says. In fact, John's giving us here this ear to hear as a diagnostic tool to recognize who is from God and who is not from God. And so verse six goes on to say, by this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How a person responds to God's truth is an indication of whether or not they've been born again and whether or not they should even be listened to if they're a teacher we should be embracing that which is given by the spirit of truth. We should be rejecting that which has been given by the spirit of error. And we should always keep in mind that there is way more error in this world than truth. And so that's John's instruction on false teachers and how to discern false teachers. Now let's go on to the next section, which is on love, because true biblical love is one of the ultimate tests to determine who is a true, genuine believer. So let's talk about this principle of love. We've looked at this concept of love a few times as we've gone through the New Testament together, especially when we were in 1 Corinthians 13. In a nutshell, the love that the scriptures talk about, it's not a romantic love, nor is biblical love talking about some kind of touchy-feely, wispy love for our fellow man. Biblical love is taking responsibility for someone and doing what's best for them in a manner that they can understand and receive. I'm going to say that again because it's really just my definition and just summarizing everything we've been studying as we've been going through God's Word together. So biblical love is taking responsibility for someone and doing what is best for them in a manner that they can understand and receive. And I'm getting this definition by distilling the principles of love from 1 Corinthians 13, uh, pulling in Christ's example from Philippians 2, and also just looking at John's teaching on God's love over the next few verses. And in fact, if you have your Bibles open, look at the following verses with me. Verse 8 says God is love, and so God is love, and our love must come from Him. Verse 11 says, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, and so God is our standard of love. And in verse 12, we get this love by abiding in fellowship with God. It says His love is perfected in us. And finally, the end of verse 17 says, as He is, so also we are in this world. And so part of our role in this world is to live out God's love. And so with this as a working definition of love that we're going to be expanding on as we go through this passage, this passage is giving us the test of true biblical love to determine the genuine nature of a person's spiritual life. And that means we need to realize that not all that glitters is gold and that there are certain kinds of love in Christianity that are really false loves that we need to be watching out for because they're not derived from God's word or fellowship with him. And the first kind of this false love is this wispy, touchy-feely love that really is just trying to be nice. Um, it's nice to be nice, but never at the expense of not giving people the truth they need to hear. And this false love is not produced by a love for God or his truth or the eternal souls of that other person. That person who is just being nice at the expense of truth 
is being nice because they don't want to offend anyone. It's really a love for themselves. They don't want to get in anyone's kitchen. They don't want to talk about hard things. They don't want to get into difficult issues. Now, another kind of false love is on the opposite side of the spectrum. And this kind of false love it relishes in tough love and has no consideration about how to actually reach people by showing them God's actual love. And in the last few years or so, it seems like there's just this rising up of this so-called Christianity that ignores biblical love and justifies fleshly, worldly ways of handling people and calling it tough love as though there's some kind of glory in offending other people. And neither one of these people are stopping to ask, am I truly loving people by the standard of God that we see here in John 4? And they themselves are in danger of plunging headlong into destruction. By definition, God's love doesn't come from our own flesh or our own emotions or our own ideas or sentiments or the, the thinking of this world. We have to intentionally seek to be conduits of God's love. And if a person is not actively, intentionally seeking to be a conduit of God's love in the world around them, at best, they just have a worldly love, which is not biblical, and at worst, their lives won't demonstrate anything that could be classified as love by any standard. And so we need to take this command to love very seriously. And that brings us then to verse 7. Verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You can see here, love is central to the Christian life. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now this fear of the love here is first and foremost within the context of the followers of Jesus Christ. And that's because if we're part of Christ's body, we're going to naturally love and support the other people who are part of this church body as well. When you think about how the parts of the body work together, the hand brings food to the mouth, the stomach processes the food and the materials for energy and muscles and things like that. The hand doesn't get bitter about the stomach and vice versa. The stomach may growl when it needs food, but the basic function is of mutual support. And that's how God's people operate with one another. They come together under the headship of Christ. They support one another. They love one another. Now, our challenge may be finding a church family where the members are actually following Christ and working together to accomplish his work in this world. For many people, going to church is a lot like going to the DMV. You barely want to go. You only go when you have to, and you get out as quick as you can. And for others, Christianity is just like going to a fortune teller at a carnival. They don't know anybody else. They're just going looking for some kind of help for a better life. For other people, they know people because it's kind of like a club. They just go there for being with their friends. But for these kinds of churchgoers, it wouldn't make sense for them to unite together and support each other because they're not actually living members of that church body. And so for these kinds of people who have no bond of love between one another, they need to take the warnings of verse 8 very seriously. Verse 8 goes on to say, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. Love is the essence of God's nature. His love is the basis of his act of creation. His love is the basis of giving humanity freedom, even if that freedom means not to worship God. His love is the basis of saving us. Every interaction we have with God is through the realm of love. And if we're in fellowship with the God of love, his love will then transform us. And if it doesn't, well, then we don't actually know God because to know God is to love with God's love. It's not about church attendance. It's not about even how much you read the Bible. Are you in fellowship with God and living out his love in the world around us? And along that line, verse 9 gives us another sphere where this love is to operate. Verse 9, really verses 9 to 11 say, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10 says, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see, God loves us and he sacrificially gave his son to be our propitiation. We saw that, what that means back in chapter 2, verse 2. He gave his son for us so that we might have life in him. And so, like God, our love should compel us to seek to reach the world around us with his love in a way that they're going to understand and a way that they're going to receive. Now, having said this, well, how does this love come into our lives? Verse 12 gives us the answer. We abide in fellowship with God. Verse 12 says, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. You see, we don't have to see God physically to see his handiwork in his people. God's love is the byproduct of abiding in fellowship with God. And those who abide in fellowship with God have his love. And those who do not have his love either don't have fellowship with him 
or they have let some sin or some wrong thinking or wrong focus on life corrode their transforming fellowship with the Lord. We're supposed to be God's conduits of love in his hands and his feet of love. And if that's not happening in our lives, we should take a serious look at the health of our walk with him. Now, going on to the next set of verses, for time's sake, we're just going to summarize them because John's restating these same tests he's been giving already, just going into them a little bit deeper. And so in verse 13, the presence of the Holy Spirit in life is proof of the genuineness of their faith and message. In verses 14 and 15, they themselves conform to this doctrinal test. In verse 16, they know God's love and abide in God's love. And in verse 17, they live out God's love. Now, let's zero in on verse 17 a little bit more because verse 17 says, By this, love is perfected within us, as in by the fellowship with God we're talking about, this fellowship that transforms our heart, mind, and soul. When his love is being perfected in us, verse 17 says, then we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. And so now we see why we need to take this matter of love so seriously. And Christians who do not love with God's standard of love here and who ignore John's instructions and his warning they do so to their own eternal peril because maybe they're not born again or maybe they're not in fellowship with God after all. And well, then the final verses in chapter four, John then begins to put some rubber onto the road of what this love is like in in personal relationships. Verse 18 talks about how fear can't be part of love. To fear other people or, or to want to be feared, that's contrary to love. Now, we might be uncomfortable with this term fear here, But I think John's just talking about any attempt to use our position or our role in this world to cause others to fear us or even be intimidated by us. Or on the flip side, uh, he's also probably addressing how there's a tendency for people to fear those who they perceive have power over them. When we're filled with God's love, we won't want others to fear us and we won't be fearful of others either. In fact, we'll be intentional in this love and we'll be proactive, loving people who don't even love us. Why? Because... Well, that's how God loves us. And so in verse 19, he says, we love because he first loved us. God loved us first. He sought us first, even when we were enemies of him. And even when the enmity of mankind led to his own physical harm, still God loves us. And so in verse 20, there is no room for hatred among God's people. If God can love us with this kind of love, when his love fills us, we will have this kind of love for those around us. So that's 1 John chapter 4. Just a couple quick takeaways here. We're we're low on time here. But specifically, let's ask ourselves, let's prayerfully ask, what kind of love do we demonstrate? And what is the source of that love? The kind of love that we see in this passage and the kind of love that was modeled by our Lord is the kind of love that does what's best for us and reaches us with that love in a way that we could hear it, see it, feel it, understand it, and receive it. But this is God's love for us. Let us be praying that this is the kind of love we have for those around us, both in our church and our world. Well, thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless. You may have also heard that we have a study guide for the book of Genesis that's available on Amazon. It has 22 lessons on the key chapters of Genesis. Each chapter in the guidebook includes the full text from the NAS Bible translation, I include some of my commentary in that passage and then some study and discussion questions for group or personal or classroom study. Now, you don't need the guidebook to listen to the podcast and you don't need the podcast to study the guidebook, but they all work together hand in hand. And so it's available on Amazon right now and I'm excited to share it with you. 